Hello everyone, my name is Malik L. Train. I'm the host of Health Awareness Talk. Today I have my co-host, uh, Master Arm Palm Master, Dale Dugas. Hello Dale, how you doing? Hey, how we doing? Uh, just fine, thank you. I have uh, Dale on the show as my co-host. Uh, he's an expert in martial arts. He's also uh, deals with acupuncture and knows about the theme about spirit, mind, and body unification. And the uh, uh, main course of today is Mr. Grant Sisulu. Hey, Grant, how you doing? Hey, man, okay. Pretty damn fine here in Australia. <laughs> okay. And the course today is about your um, book, Embraining, Using Your Brains to Do Cool Stuff. Uh, that's a pretty nice title. What's that all about? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, when my co-author Marvin Oka and I sat down to uh, write a book about the neuroscience of uh, the fact that you know, neuroscience has been discovering that we've got complex adaptive functional neural networks or what they're calling brains in the heart and gut regions, we were trying to we were struggling with what are we going to call this book and who are we going to write it for? And, you know, in the end we decided we're just going to pick a title that we liked. So we thought it was pretty cool stuff that uh, what we were discovering and uncovering. So we just said, you know, let's let's call it using your multiple brains to do cool stuff because at the end of the day, uh, it, it has to pass the so what, what we call the so what test when we're doing our work, our research work. We're going, you know, so what? What can you do with this? If you can't do something practical with it, then it's just kind of a bunch of good info that's a head trip. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so yeah, so what we've come up with is a, a very pragmatic, powerful, yet simple model for how you can coach others or yourself into getting more wisdom and alignment in your life, how to achieve the sorts of success that you want by uh, you know, really tapping in at the, the heart and gut level to the intuitive intelligence that mm -hmm. uh, you know, wisdom traditions have, been, have known for thousands of years. You know, Des Dale will, I'm sure, be able to validate. Uh, Chinese traditional medicine, Taoist philosophy, has known for a couple thousand years that we have centers of intelligence in our heart and gut regions, you know, down to ends. And uh, so, you know, it's really important that when now neuroscience is validating this, that we can start to bring some precision to validate, what, you know, the precision of a couple of thousand years. Yes. But it, for the head brain, for the Western minded head brain, it's really important to have this science convincer. Otherwise, people call it just all that flaky woo-woo stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, amongst the flaky woo-woo stuff, there is some, um, what I'd call, you know, sort of historical, socio-political stuff that creeps in, mythology that creeps in over thousands of years. So there's some stuff that's really absolute science um, and, and is pragmatic and they knew about it. And there's other stuff that you might go, well, we either haven't proven it yet or it might just be some artifacts because humans are very good at sticking artifactual stuff in. You know, we're, we're pretty good at getting mythologies going. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what we've tried to do is look at all of the different wisdom and spiritual traditions and look at all of the science, marry them together for, you know, with a common factor analysis and go, well, at this stage, we're pretty sure we can, we can with certainty, say these particular competencies and functions are imbued in heart and gut and how you communicate with them, how you align them, how you tap into your own inner wisdom wisdom and as science uncovers more we'll just keep adding it into the model because uh, we're, not, we're not saying that you know, the other aspects that we haven't put in the model aren't correct we're just saying we want this to be a scientifically based model so that it really paces the, the world model uh, where you know, the western world's at mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and lord love the western world but given what we're doing on the planet right now mm -hmm. uh, I really think that we need to bring some more wisdom to, to our world model and if we can get people to be convinced there's a runaway society we've got which is largely you know from the head up right mm -hmm. where, where, since 2000 years ago when the, as Edward Abano calls them the gang of three you know people like Plato etc mm -hmm. uh, they developed philosophies that science came out of that developed technologies and look at all these amazing technologies we have I'm sitting on one side of the planet you guys are on another side of the planet we can have these incredible you know, meetings of mind and share this information out across the world. Brilliant technology has given us some amazing stuff, but it's led us as a society to cut off from the neck downwards. We, we you know, denigrate this incredible wisdom that our body has. And uh, so what we want to do is reclaim that through, through the filters of science. Okay. So that's the cool stuff for us. Okay. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thanks for being with me. <laughs> that's good. First, Robert, yeah. Robert, how's the audio? Oh, it was fine. Okay, just want to make sure. It sounds like Grant was breaking up a little bit. Just well, I'm sure he was, but that's, that's Skype. There's ah, nothing that's you can good. do about that. All right, super. Uh, you had a question, um, Dale? Me? No, no, I'm just listening along and, and agreeing that, 
you know, in Chinese medicine, we view the body as having, you know, three areas of, you know, influence upon our whole structure. And we talk about, you know, Jing, Qi, Shen. Jing is your essence, and that's in your kidney area. That's like a lower area, you know, uh, fueling all your hormones. Then we have the Qi, which is in the middle section of your body, you know, which is the energy of the body, you know, in the, in the center of the body, you know, the heart area. And then you've got your Shen you know, the spirit up here. So they, they look at a, a three tiered approach. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's it's amalg- you know, amalgamous with, with what Grant's talking about is this visceral, you know, hard visceral, you know, cerebral kind of way of looking at it. And it's I look at it as more organic. You know, you're you're breaking it down into these three layers, you know, that we use, you know, on a daily basis. And if you can utilize, you know, techniques and tools to, you know, optimize this, then you can work better, you can learn better. And so I, I, I totally agree with what, where we're going with, you know, Grant and his book, mm-hmm. you know, and, and its material. It's, it's just great because a lot of times you don't see this in mainstream media. You know, this is stuff that's kind of esoteric, that's taught to students of various traditions, you know, depending on where you're looking at it. You know, um, I trained something of this with internal exercise, you know, in, in the Bagua Jung system I learned from Dr. John Painter. We did standing exercises where we had, a, you know, we're going to think about using the brain, the shen. Oh, we're going to, you know, use the body. Oh, we're going to use the kidneys. And holding different postures and thinking, you know, various visualizations. So it's funny how, you know, every tradition kind of did this. If you look at it across Western and Eastern, you can find it and you can find the correlations and it's just wonderful to see. Okay, that definitely is. Uh, for, um, two questions. First, um, Dale, don't you have your own so what uh, uh, paradigm or uh, rules or something that you go by? Well, there's, you know, when when looking at this stuff, there's various traditions. So what, what tradition are you? You know, you've got various, you know, rule sets or, uh, you know, directions on how to do these kind of things. You know, so... Depending on what you do, I do a trans a transmission, or I do you know various material where I do things where the sun is rising as well as the moon is rising, you know, to you know visualize and train certain parts of the body. So it's very funny how it's very organic, and mm-hmm. this comes from more of a Taoist you know background, mm-hmm. but you find it in other things in shamanism and in, you know Tibetan traditions and you know in Southeast Asian traditions, you know you even find it in certain you know, uh, Judeo-Catholic or, you know, Western mm-hmm. civilization mm-hmm. And, and religions, mm-hmm. you know, something similar where they're breaking it into, mm-hmm. you know, three spirits, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, things like that. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, th- see, the whole point, the whole point why I even have M-Braining, which stands for multiple brains, on the show today yeah. is yeah. because Grant Sasulu brings something unique to the table. What they've yeah. actually, his specializes research on, that they are actually three brains, scientific Typically, there are three brains. Just like the, we, we got the brain that's in between our ears, we have thinking mechanisms, which is our heart and also our gut brain, which has their own particular, own specific way of thinking. So, Grant, could you further go into it, how your research differentiates from all the other modalities and what makes um, what you're doing so unique? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, so <clears throat> what we did was we looked at the new, we took the neuroscience and the uh, fields of neurocardiology and the new field of neurogastroenterology, and in particular the work of uh, a gentleman by the name of Professor Gershon, who wrote a book called The Second Brain about the gut brain, about the enteric nervous system. And it's kind of interesting because when I started researching uh, Gershon's work and and this field, I actually came across a book that was published back in 1895, and it was a Western a medical book, an anatomist, had written a book about the enteric and reproductive brains. And uh, he had said that he had discovered you know, a complex nervous system down in the gut and reproductive regions. Interestingly enough, we've now got the new, new field of you know, neurogastroenterology, been going about 10 or 15 years, and they're uncovering almost on a monthly basis new findings about the enteric nervous system and how it, it, you know, what it does and how it impacts. There's some fascinating research coming out of the work on the gut, for example, just uh, two months ago, there was some work, and I think this is really interesting because it's uh, it validates what we're saying in embraining really strongly, but it does it through an animal model. You know, sometimes when you've got research on humans, people go, oh, it could be placebo effect. You know, you could have influenced the human's perception somehow or other. But if you've yeah. got something like rats, it's pretty hard to influence a rat's perception uh, through you know language, etc. Because obviously rats don't speak human. 
so what they did was they wanted to see the impact of the gut brain enteric nervous system on fear and courage behaviors because well as we know in our own neuro linguistics in our own common ways of speaking if someone's really courageous we'll call them gutsy we know that fear is often felt and imbued in the gut region and you have to do things like if you go out and do behavioral modeling work with people who have done incredibly courageous and brave things and i have done work with you know, navy seals and sas soldiers and and people who are in the gulf war etc who were going to very dangerous live fire situations to save people's lives and they talk about how you, you don't go into a situation like that where you know uh, you either got to kill somebody yeah. to save someone's life or you could be killed. Um, so you're going in for what is a positive intention, positive values, trying to minimize the, the damage and risk. But you know that someone's going to potentially die in this situation where you've got terrorists holding hostages in a house. So they talk about holding, having this fear in the, in the front of their gut, but they need to push through the fear. And that they, you know, literally we've heard, they hear this neurolinguistics of getting some backbone to be able to push through the fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we talk about people who are, who, who are, you know, they have a lot of fear of being spineless. And so there's, there's something going on there about, uh, you know, that, that gut region and being gutsy. So what they did is they took rats and they cut the vagus nerve that innovates the gut region from the head region. From the central mm -hmm. nervous system comes down through the autonomic nervous system down into the gut region. They cut the vagus nerve so that no signals could get from the gut back up to the head and what they found was that the rats then lost their fear behaviors you couldn't condition them into fear and aversive situations so they effectively became much more courageous rats wow what yeah did, what did yeah. they do they cut their what they cut the nerves that run from the gut brain up to the head brain so yeah. no signals could get from the gut back up to the head. now the enteric nervous system the gut brain is sufficiently complex as a brain that you don't need a connection to the head brain for the gut to do its work to digest. Okay, so the gut brain does all of the work it needs to do to say, oh, incoming food, digest, excrete, etc. And by the way, the gut brain is also responsible for about 80 to 85% of immune function. Okay. So a lot of the immune system is in the gut okay. or is controlled by the gut. So when they cut the vagus, when they cut the vagus vein, the uh, rats lost the capability to feel fear or did they just, uh, just were more courageous? Well, they weren't able to be conditioned into fearful, stim in, into fearful responses. So, hard to tell what the rat's actually feeling because you can't, you know, <laughs> to a human, you go, what are you feeling now? Uh, with the rat, you know, all you can do is track its behavior. And what they could see is that when they put the rats into situations they normally can quickly condition, you know, like they, they shock a rat when they make a sound and the rat will run away from the sound. These rats yeah. no longer did that behavior. Okay. So, they, therefore, you know, you, can, you would, if you anthropomorphize it back to humans, you'd go, they're much more courageous. They don't feel that fear. And so the, the rats actually showed much more um, sort of uh, adventure behavior. They'd go into new situations quicker than uh, the other rats that didn't have that nerve cut. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, it, I think it just really nicely validates what, what you know, the field of you know, neurogastroenterology has been saying, which is that the gut brain is used in a number of, um, or what, what Professor Antonio Damasio uh, who's a, a neurophysiologist, what he calls uh, in his somatic marker theory, it's called somatic re-representation. In other words, the body is being used to help the brain, the head brain, track what's going on. So when the, you're in a situation where you need to know, is this fearful and do I need to take courageous action? The head brain is actually using the, the, the gut region as part of its sort of off, you know, offline processing, it's sort of like distributed processing, a bit like, say, in a computer system or on the internet, there are different servers that serve up different functions. So if you want to go to Facebook, you've got to go to you know, Facebook servers to, to go to a Facebook web page. Well, the head brain goes to the gut to go, what's going on with this courage and fear thing? Uh, should I be fearful about this, et cetera. So, right. so what we did in our work was we looked at the neuroscience, we looked at uh, behavioral modeling, which is, you know, behavioral modeling is a field that grew out of the, the area of neuro-linguistic programming, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, NLP. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's, it, behavioral modeling was the methodology it was used to develop, the band and Grinder used to develop NLP. Mm -hmm. And Marvin Oker and I are uh, behavioral modelers, and what we do is we go looking for human behavior. If a human can do a particular piece of excellence, piece of you know, repeated behavior that they can do, 
with you know, uh, competence and elegance, then they must have some unconscious process that they're using to do it. And when you go and speak to experts, most of them can't tell you how it is that they do what they do. They just have learned to do it over mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. You know, develop mastery. So we have a methodology that allows us to go and speak to the experts, to work with them, and to unpack what the underlying unconscious processes are. And, and that's called behavioral modeling. So mm-hmm. we use this methodology, behavioral modeling, but we... In, we use the neuroscience to inform the behavioral modeling mm-hmm. in order to know what to go and do the behavioral modeling on and mm-hmm. where to put our focus and attention neurologically. So uh, we did this behavioral modeling. We did the gathering up of the neuroscience. We looked at all the spiritual traditions, esoteric traditions, etc. And from these divergent sources of evidence, we pulled back you know, together a, a common factor model to mm-hmm. say, what do we think are the core competencies? What are the skills? What are the domains of expertise of the heart, gut, and head? Mm-hmm. And how do they communicate together? Okay. And in particular, how do they bring... Because when, when you look at somebody who's doing what you'd say really wise behavior, now wisdom, you can't tell beforehand, it's only after the fact you can tell whether something was wise or not, mm-hmm. and you see what outcomes it achieved. But uh, if you look at somebody doing really wise behavior, after the fact, you go, wow, this person's got a lot of wisdom in the decisions they made. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You'll find that there's one common process they do, and that is they get totally aligned at head, heart, and gut level. They listen to those intuitive intelligences Mm -hmm. of the heart and gut around their domains of expertise Mm -hmm. and tap in with the head. And when the whole of them goes, yes, then they're making the wisest decision that they can in that situation. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, that's absolutely right. And, and obviously, they put themselves in a place to learn better. There's one other thing we have to factor in here, and I'm sure Dale will be able to um, bring some really interesting points to the table on this one, mm-hmm. and that is the importance of the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system is the, the you know, we have the somatic nervous system, the system that we can consciously use to control our musculature, etc. and we have the autonomic nervous system, which it's automatic, it's autonomic, it, it's outside of conscious awareness typically, and it does the beating of our heart and uh, speaks to the gut to get the, f- the gut to digest the food. It tracks for danger. And it's if you go and learn you know, neurophysiology 101, if you go to study medicine or if you study nursing or psychology, history, I'll talk you, they'll teach you about the autonomic nervous system. And it has two arms, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, I like to think about it like, you know, as in the accelerator of the car and the brake of the car. The sympathetic is the accelerator and it's, it's the stress system. When you get a, a bit of danger, like a rat, you know, it, where a, an electric shock comes in, it will yeah. sense that, that danger and the sympathetic arm will kick in and it'll do what's called fight or flight, mm-hmm. two Fs. Now, they have, they, when you're learning autonomic nervous system, they say the four Fs of the autonomic nervous system. There are two Fs for the sympathetic, two Fs for the parasympathetic. So, so the, the danger comes in, the stressor comes in, you, you have to get out of there, so you put your foot on the accelerator and you get the flock out of there, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're, you're now doing, say, 100 miles an hour down the road away from the danger, you better do something or you're going to run into you know, the, the next corner where you're not going to get around 100 miles now. So you better slow the car down once the danger's gone away. If the danger's gone, if the stressor's gone, then, hey, you know what? We need some way to slow the system down. That's the break. That's the parasympathetic. And it brings you back to, to balance, brings you back to homeostasis. Starts to, you know, you've used a lot of energy to get the, the flock out of there. Now it's, uh, get, it brings you back, starts to rebuild your energy reserves, etc. So I like to think of, you know, the S for sympathetic, S for stress, P for parasympathetic, P for peace. Sort of the, the opposite. You know, they work, normally they work in reciprocal action, like the accelerator and the brake work in reciprocal action. But they can work together at the same time. You can drive down the road with your foot on the accelerator and your foot accidentally on the brake. And you know what happens to your car when you do that? Pretty soon you need to see the auto mechanic, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, true, very true. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens. Dale will see a lot of people who will come in because they're leaving, leading incredibly ongoing, chronic, stressful lives. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. So their sympathetic okay. system's amped up. Yep. But their parasympathetic system is kicked in as riding the brake trying to get them to slow down. But they're not yep. slowing down. They're not listening to the signals. No. Mm-hmm. And now they're in what, what we call a metastable state, right? It's like they've got sympathetic and parasympathetic both maxed out. And yep. they'll be bouncing between the two. Uh, yes. some, in some research shows that it looks like bi- some forms of bipolar disorder look like this, manic depressive. Yes. And uh, it's really mega unhealthy. So I'm going to hand across to Dale for a short while to talk about some of what you know, he's seen and what that's about. Because... I'll tell you this much, the research shows you do not make your best decisions, your wisest decisions when you're stressed or when no. you're depressed. No. So you need to have that what's called coherence or balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. So Dale, what, what's your thoughts on all this? Oh, you see, you know, many people that come into acupuncture clinics are burning it at both ends, they're in stressful jobs, you know, family situations, work, you know, most of them, a lot of them are students, 
you know, in undergraduate school, graduate school, you know, they're, they're learning, they're in some kind of program. So they come to see you because their stress levels are, you know, maxing out and they're, they're having physical issues. They're having, you know, headaches, you know, indigestion, constipation, you know, pain or just general malaise. And, and they're, they want to know and they've, they've gone to doctors and they've been tested. And it's in most cases, you know, you don't see anything other than a, you know an increase in what they call cortisol, which is that stress hormone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you're when you're under stress from where whatever the source, it doesn't matter whether it's mental or physical, you know, your cortisol levels can be elevated. And so when people come in, I'm trying to trigger a response for that level. I want to reduce that level, you know. And so we have these protocols for you know calming the mind, calming the body. You know, and we, you know, we learn them at school. Okay, we put the protocol and put the needles in. And usually within, you know, any, it, it all depends on the person. But within, you know, two to four treatments, you're seeing some kind of response. And, you know, you have to. You have to bring your A game when you're an acupuncturist because, you know, if you don't do a great job the first time, you know, your patients usually don't come back. So really looking at the problem, we try to diagnose, are they having, you know, what kind of issue is it? You know, is it a Shen, you know, a disturbance, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time it's an energy disturbance, you know, in Chinese medicine, we look at the liver as, you know, the holder of anger, the emotion of anger. So when people come in and they're angry, I need to tonify their liver. The liver organ needs some support, Mm -hmm. you know, and we we look at other emotions as well. But, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent here. But again, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when people come Mm -hmm. in, it's usually because of some kind of stress. It doesn't matter. I've got women coming in for fertility. Because they're in stressful jobs, you know, the, the, everybody wants them to have the grandkids. Oh, we're going to name the baby, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know, the husbands are looking at that ovulation calendar and, you know, that week performance week of, hey, let's get it on. And they're having performance anxiety. So I, I, I sometimes when I see the women, you know, I say, hey, you know, who's your partner? And, you know, when I suss out that information and say, oh, if you're doing it the old-fashioned way, why don't you bring them in too? Because I bet you dollars to donuts that their stress levels are going through the roof too Mm -hmm. and so if you get both people you get you know you get them and you get their cortisol levels down and you get them into a a better zone where their body is you know uh, compensating for all all the stress they look at each other they get pregnant so it's funny you got to get the the, but you know you got to get this brain you got to get the you know the brain you got to get the brain going with the gut Mm -hmm. you know because i you know, because I mean, you can look at this. You can look at the two hearts down here as one big heart. Mm-hmm. You've got the visceral, and you've got, you know, the ventral, and then you've got this cerebral. So mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. people say there's two, three, four. You know, there's all these traditions that can break it down, but it it comes back to basically, you know, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, is how do we get yeah. to balance? Like 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 Grant was talking about. Yeah. You, we we need balance. Mm-hmm. If you're up mm-hmm. if you're up here, we need to bring you down. If you're down here, we need to bring you up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's that it's that simple. It's just okay. How do we apply that in treating people with acupuncture and herbal medicine? That's you know? absolutely true. Now, from you know, I'm a, a personal trainer, okay. And from my perspective, you know, I just don't believe anything that somebody tells me, okay. Uh, yep. You got to show me or whatever. And going yeah. for, uh, going from uh, embraining, uh, uh, what medical evidence that your heart and you got a Pacific uh, grant, you got a Pacific uh, modality or a Pacific thing that says uh, the heart is a brain because the, if it's something is called a brain, it must do X, Y, Z. OK, our brain between our yeah. ears does yeah. X, Y, Z. Because it can do that, heart does X Y Z. Our gut does X Y Z. That's why we qual- that's why we qualify both the heart and the uh, uh, gut as being a brain, a literal brain, because they have their own way of thinking. Could you break that down scientifically as to why that you believe that the heart and the guts are brain, as just like the one we have between our ears? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important point because it is, you know, you've got, it's an important convincer for people to know whether or not these things are just m- being used metaphorically or whether they're actually being used at scientifically, scientifically accurately. Now, for a start, what we're going to say is it's not Marvin and I that are calling them brains. It's actually the scientists in these fields that are looking at the neural structures of the heart and gut are saying that these neural structures qualify as brains. So uh, in our book, Embraining, as you know, Malik, uh, we've actually looked at what was the criteria the scientists used and spelled it out in detail. 
so some of the criteria, I mean, there's a list of it, and I won't go through it all, and some of it gets quite scientific, but the things like you have to have not just a large number of neurons. Like for a start, you have to have a fairly large number of neurons. You couldn't have two neurons and call it a brain. Uh, <laughs> some people out in the world might only have that many, mm. uh, jokingly. But uh, you've got to have, uh, so the eyeball, for example, has a huge number of neurons in it, but we don't, no one's calling the eyeball a brain. You know, uh, the ophthalmologists aren't saying, oh, wow, you've got eyeball brains. <laughs> so a number of your neurons alone is enough now. You know, uh, if we look at the gut brain, for example, it's got 500 million neurons, which is about the size of a cat's brain mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, or a dog's brain. Now, if you look at the, the level of intelligence you get in a cat or a dog, if any of your listeners have pets, they'll know, you know if you come home from work, uh, who gets fed first? Usually uh, the cat or the dog, right? And that's how well, intelligent yeah. they are. Uh -huh, they can uh -huh. organize your behavior. Uh -huh. If you look at yeah. the, all the levels of communication and, and um, you know, environmental monitoring and tracking that a cat or dog brain, cat or dog can do, that's what 500 million neurons will bring to you. Mm -hmm. But 500 million neurons alone isn't enough to be called a brain. Right. So you, what you need is a complex layering of what are called interneurons. They're neurons that connect amongst other ne neurons and build feedback and feed forward paths so that they can get this thing called reentrancy, which allows for a very complex processing and learning. And that's what you see in the heart and gut brain that you don't see in, say, parts of the spinal column or the eyeball, etc. Uh, so you also need uh, other support cells like glial cells, mm -hmm. microglia, things that are cells that actually are now there. They used to think they were just support cells and uh, up in the head brain. But now they've discovered in the last couple of years, and, and on a monthly basis, there's new research coming out all the time on just how important these cells are, the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and these glia cells, uh, for actual thinking and processing. That They're doing lots of complex um, functional behavior that's involved in how neurons fire and wire together. Mm -hmm. So the heart, brain, and gut brain exhibits that. You have to have neural plasticity. The heart and gut brain exhibits neural plasticity, the ability to grow new, new dendrites, new neurons, um, increase synaptic strength. So you have to have functions like memory, uh, adaptiveness, etc. And the heart and gut brains do learn. Uh, so it, it, there's, you know, um, I could go on and on, but there's a list of very specific uh, scientific criteria for why the scientists are saying these things are brains, and the neurocardiologists are saying there's a little heart, a little brain in the heart. And mm -hmm. a neurogastroenterologist is saying there's a you know, second brain, uh, and another quite huge brain in the gut. Now, th this is really uh, important, and there's some really interesting and important data that came out. I came across an interesting study on somebody, because the, there's all these numbers bandied about, about how many neurons are in the heart, for example, mm -hmm, in the heart mm -hmm. brain. And I'm going, well, so, the, and the numbers varied quite widely. And I kept thinking, so which number is it? What's going on? Can I find a study where somebody actually... It has reported on, on science of the number of neurons in the heart brain. There was this fascinating study where somebody had taken a bunch of, uh, of you know, cadavers' hearts with all the tissue around it so they could get the heart brain because the heart brain innovates all around in a number of flexi around and within the, the heart. And it's why uh, you get some, we could talk some, if you want, interesting stuff about when they do heart lung transplants and the, sh the personality shifts that occur in a small number of people who get heart lung transplants, mm -hmm. which I think is a very, kind of an interesting um, look at the, the level of intelligence and memory that might be imbued in the heart brain. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, what they found was that uh, typically young people have more neurons in their heart and as you age, the number of neurons in their heart decreases. But they found some old people, some 70-year-old um, heart brains, that it still had the same number of neurons as a child. And I think we, if, we, if we looked around the world and said, do we see examples of this? You, you, I think you do. In normal and common you know, neuro-linguistic parlance, we say, we look at somebody who's still uh, quite young at heart, even though they're old, and we'll see that they've got that real curiosity, um, real uh, orientation to life that is like a young spirit, mm -hmm. whereas other people harden their heart, and they're almost dead-hearted. Right, mm -hmm. and they're, they're heartless, mm -hmm. and because they've closed off the emotions or the emotional processing, the heart does. So, so this is a good segue into. So, what are the? What did we find in our research? What are the prime functions of these three brains? So, what we found was, uh, and we'll start. I'll start with the heart, because there's 
Dale knows in tr Chinese traditional medicine, uh, the Taoists, you know, with, with incredible insight, say the heart is the emperor and the gut is the general. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the heart leads, the heart actually guides everything. You start with the heart and in almost all spiritual traditions, they focus on the heart because the heart allows you to make huge shifts in the whole of the mind-body system. If you can get the heart to shift, then the head will shift, the gut will shift. So you start with the heart and there's some really good and important reasons why you do that. Uh, and it's linked to how the heart connects and innovates into that autonomic nervous system we we're talking about. So if you get a heart shift, you'll get an autonomic nervous system shift, and usually people will get stressed if something's impacting them at a heart level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so what we found was the heart is responsible for mo uh, many emotions, a lot of those sort of heart-based emotions, for values, what's important to you. You know, you know what's important to you mm -hmm, when you feel it mm -hmm. at the heart level, and for relational effect, your connection with others. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right, so, so those those three prime functions: your emotions, your values, what's important to you, and how you connect your feelings and connection with others. Mm -hmm. The gut, and I'll come back to, to that shortly, and we'll have a little little bit of a play because there's something that Dale said earlier that I'd like to connect back with um, when he was talking about different sorts of gestures and the way you use, um, you know, your your body to evoke and connect in with these different centres. And and you know, the Chinese traditional medicine has a huge body of Sort of, you know, what you might call empirical evidence over, you know, evidence base over a, th a couple thousand years of techniques that they know, you know, work and science is starting to back that up. Uh, so uh, the gut brain, for example, now I'll explain the gut brain's prime functions by a little story, if I may, of what I call Cecil the sea slug. So uh, one of the, the other things that we looked at was the uh, evolutionary history of, of, you know, our organism. And what we see is in evolutionary history, the gut brain formed first. So when multicellular organisms got going and eventually, you know, rolled up into a tube and formed little worm-like structures, they were so complex. And an amoeba or a couple of cells together doesn't need a nervous system to communicate. But once you get something like a worm, it has to communicate so that you know, each end knows what to do. You don't get both ends trying to head in different directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the, the worm-like structure, which is sea slugs, sea cucumbers, helminths, you know, all these little worm-like structures that evolved you know, millions and millions of years ago, uh, they needed a nervous system. So what the nervous system they evolved is actually the, what is our enteric nervous system, the gut brain in humans, is the same as the, the brain of a sea slug. And there are particular forms of sea slugs, Aplesia californica, which have really large neurons in them, and that's what the neurogastroenterologists like Professor Gershon use in order to study the uh, the basis of the enteric nervous system, what it's doing, because they can get you know, electrodes into these these um, uh, enteric brains, the gut brains, which is the whole brain of a, a you know an aplesia, a, a sea slug. So you you have these sea slugs. Now, if you think about in in the primal soup of the ocean back millions billions of years ago, and you've got these little worm-like structures, what do they need to do? What does their brain need to do for them? And it needs to monitor their environment for threat or opportunity for danger or for food or you know, another sexy sea slug and then it has to move forward or backwards towards food or away from danger so motility movement and it needs to as it assimilates molecules into it through its its mouth end and it excretes molecules out its you know, opposite end its its, its bum end uh, it needs to be able to decide whether a molecule should be absorbed into self or not self and whether the molecules that are in there are got to be excreted as not self. So it actually has to do a core self, monitor core visceral self. And in humans, that's what the gut brain largely does. They monitor, the gut brain is there for monitoring threat, and boundary, you know, boundary detection, knowing all around you, your mm -hmm. semantic space, what's important to you from a protection and threat perspective. Um, for, for that, which is life affirming, to be able to move towards food, etc needs to be able to get moving. It's used in that sense of visceral motivation to get moving. Uh, and it's involved in core visceral self. Mm. And that this stuff links deeply to all sorts of levels, not just at a food level, although you know, it is very much at obviously at a food level, but also, as I said, uh, 80 to 85% of your immune function is controlled by the enteric nervous system. Mm -hmm. So... That means the gut brain is doing, uh, and if you think about what immune function does, the immune function in your body is m monitor for self, not self, and good self, bad self. 
so it attacks pathogens and invaders or destroys cells that are damaged and, sh and no longer should be growing like cancer cells mm -hmm. so it, it, you can see the links back to the uh, you know the evolutionary history of uh, and, and by the way in the womb we looked at embryology in the womb the gut brain forms first mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the neural as the little blastocyst is forming and you get this neural plate that starts to roll up at the umbilicus region of the, the developing fetus it, as it, the plate forms a tube, at that point, a little outpoaching occurs called the neural crest. And that neural crest then innovates all through the torso. And that's why, uh, I think, in the, you know, the Taoist, the Chinese, Chinese traditional medicine, they talk about making, di they actually differentiate the enteric or gut um, uh, competencies into even more refined grains. So they have like the, the liver and with anger, etc. You know, the, the kidneys do, do other things. Uh, because, in fact, the enteric nervous system grows out, innovates throughout all of the organs in the torso, I including uh, it co-innovates the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And we can come back to that because it's a really important key. Breathing is one of the most powerful ways you can begin to influence your gut brain, head brain and autonomic nervous system and heart brain. So, you know, it, it's, it's a leverage point that almost all spiritual and esoteric uh, and martial arts traditions use to yep. be able to control the mind-body system. Mm -hmm. yep. Most people aren't aware of their breathing patterns or how their breathing patterns are being, responding to stress and shifting their whole you know, mind-body system, their health, their immune function, everything. Uh, so in terms of you know, personal development, personal training, etc., and knowing how to breathe mm -hmm. and breathe properly to bring balance is absolutely vital. And it's really simple. Once you know, you know and understand the neurophysiology of it, you'll get it. Um, so the enteric brain is, is about all those things. And, and, you know, when it comes to something like learning, we talk about having to digest an idea. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me ruminate over that. Give me some time to digest it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I can't swallow that idea. That piece of information just give me, I can't swallow it. Why do we use expressions like, I've got to digest and I can't swallow? Because you'll find that in order to truly learn something, you actually have to take it in at a core gut level. If your gut rejects some new piece of information that doesn't fit with who you are at a deep core identity level, you'll reject it completely to the point where people will actually vomit. If you tell them something that so offends their core sense of self, they will actually vomit. Wow. You know, so these things are all completely linked up in this way. So the gut mm -hmm. brain mm -hmm. is involved in the prime functions of tracking what's what's you, what should be part of you, mm -hmm. and, and about, you know, you can see about that motility, getting movement, motivation, mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. see about that threat and boundary monitoring, why the gut does the fear stuff. Mm -hmm. And equally, why you have to do the courage stuff, which is pushing through the fear. And you actually need gutsy courage. You need to, at a gut level, push through. And... and it, from a behavioral modeling and neurolinguistic perspective, when we looked at this with these courageous soldiers, etc., mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were saying that they, had, they felt this push from the back of their, their gut, mm -hmm. from the, you know, the, the back region through to the front of the gut mm -hmm. in order to push through that fear. So I started going, well, I wonder if there's any you know, the neurophysiological basis for this back to front thing. Because mm. uh, definitely it's showing up again and again in neurolinguistics, in behavioral modeling. And then I looked at the embryology, and it turns out that the gut brain, as it's developing in, in the fetus, mm -hmm. actually pairs off, just like the head brain has two lobes, left and right lobe, mm -hmm. you know, the left and right hemispheres. The gut brain actually divides up into a foregut and a hindgut. There are two separate, you can say lobes, they're not lobal, but you know, mm -hmm. two separate arms to the gut brain, enteric nervous system, a foregut and a hindgut. Now, isn't it interesting that the fear is represented in the front, in the, in the foregut, but you get the courage to push through, to push through that fear from the hindgut. And the etymology of the word courage is really interesting. It actually comes from, you know, from the French and originally from the old Latin, um, and it's encore. Encore means of the heart. Mm -hmm. So we talk about like in brave heart. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's because to, to truly do courage, and, and this, is, you know, this, this is where something that's uh, one of the most um, important findings of our work in M-braining or you know, this field we're calling multiple brain integration techniques or MBIT for short, mm -hmm. um, MBIT coaching. What we found is that each of the brains has what we call their most adaptive competency, their highest expression. So for the heart, it's compassion. And when a human is doing that, which really brings the heart alive and truly shows us to be you know, so deeply, truly human, well, what the heart is doing when it's doing its best is compassion. You can use different words if you want, call it love, call it loving kindness, you know, whatever you want, but that sense of caring about others as if you and them are one, 
truly make, wanting to make a difference and alleviate suffering and add value to someone's life. Mm-hmm. This, is what, this is when the heart is truly alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the head brain, the, the reason we're still not swinging from trees and thinking that bananas are pretty cool, like most monkeys are still doing, is because as primates, we've actually developed this incredible capacity for creativity. We are inherently creative, and that's what the head brain is so really good at. It's, it's great at creativity. But of course, creativity that's not tempered by compassion can end up doing terribly destructive things. I mean, the Nazi Germans uh, were, you couldn't say they weren't creative. They created some amazing technologies to be able to do terribly destructive things. It's just that their creativity was not directionalized by compassion for all humanity. You also uh, note that the courage is the guts, the prime function or its highest expression. That gutsy courage, the ability to push through lethargy or fear, to really you know, live to your fullest. So it's compassion, creativity and courage, the, the 3C model. Interestingly enough, I had discovered 10 years ago, and I'd, I'd uh, forgotten that I'd discovered this, but I had a, uh, written on a piece of paper. 10 years previously to my research on the multiple brains, I'd come across in reading some stuff on Tibetan Bon. Mm-hmm. The Tibetan Bon, the Bon pose, is an ancient um, spiritual tradition that was an Aboriginal tradition from the region of Tibet. Uh, and it goes back, it has an oral history, record history that's been um, validated uh, through dating mechanisms, etc., to being over 14,000 years old. But certainly it's, you know, for the last five, 6,000 years, been up in Tibet, predates Buddhism, and Buddhism largely kind of in Tibet uh, utilized or, or built on the Bon Po um, yeah. philosophies. And the, the Bon religion said that uh, if you want to have lived a truly wise life, wise life, you just needed to master three skills. And these are the skills of compassion, creativity, and courage. Mm-hmm. So I'd had that written on a piece of paper because I, when I read that in that book, I went, oh, wow, you know, cool. And I didn't know they were imbued in the heart and gut, of course. I just the, the 3C model. Wow, cool. I stuck on this, this piece of paper in my office where I put all these sort of cool and interesting things. And uh, then I was, after I did the common factor analysis of all of these core competencies of the heart, brain, gut, brain, head, brain, I had this list of, of competencies. And, that, and the competencies divided up into sympathetic you know, sort of type competencies, mm-hmm. parasympathetic type competencies, and what yeah. we, we call coherent or balanced competencies when your autonomic nervous system is balanced. So each of the brains, it turns out, is innervated by that autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, the accelerator and the brake. Mm-hmm. And the autonomic nervous system itself, there's been a huge amount of research done in the last five years on it. There's literally thousands of papers coming out every year on the autonomic nervous system. And the researchers are saying the autonomic nervous system Whilst there's only been one or two are saying it could be called a brain in its own right, um, you know, so then it's not uh, common uh, scientific validation that you'd call the autonomic nervous system a brain, but they're saying it's an adaptive system that has memory and intelligence. If they measure signals coming from the head brain into the autonomic nervous system, by the time they get to the end effector organ, say at the liver or et cetera, the gut brain, uh, what they find is the signals are completely changed. Mm. So the head brain's going, I want to send this signal, and the autonomic nervous system's looking at the whole of the mind body of the, of the person and the environment they're in and going, you know what, you might, head, you might want to be saying this signal, but I'm changing it into this signal, hmm. something completely different because that's important. So the autonomic nervous system, and, and, and also I'll just toss in the autonomic nervous system is uh, likely, it's a lot of research evidence showing that it's involved in PTSD. Mm-hmm. You know, post, post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, the, the autonomic nervous system learns to react or overreact to certain sorts of stimuli, whether those internal stimuli from the three brains or external stimuli. Uh, and, and information feeds into the autonomic nervous system in a kind of a crude way. So the autonomic nervous system picks up information from the eyes, for example. So the visual information is not level of detail that goes to the visual cortex, mm-hmm. so it can't see details, but it sees general patterns. It picks up information from the inner ears. It picks up information from all of your skin. And it's yeah. tracking for what's in your informational environment to see whether it's sa- safe or not. And uh, so this autonomic nervous system innovates head, heart, and gut brains and taking information from them and feeding into them. Mm-hmm. So if you get into a stressed mode, the sympathetic arms amped up, or a depressed mode, the parasympathetic arms a- amped up or over-amped up, or both, like you know, Dale says, he sees people coming in both stressed and depressed, they're in this metastable state, it puts the head, heart, and gut brains into the same sort of processing mode. 
That, that's one of the, you know, the, the key findings from our work, that you really have to look at what autonomic mode the person's operating in, and then you need to leverage them into a balanced mode, into a coherent mode. So it's the equivalent of where the car's sitting with the engine idling sweetly, and, and you're ready to put the brake on. You haven't got your foot on the brake, and you haven't amped the accelerator down, but you could do either equally in balance, one after the other, not both together, so yeah. that you have the car, you know, the, the, the whole human system operating in its most adaptive place. When you do that, the head, heart, and gut brains operate in their most adaptive mode, and that allows for the highest expressions to come out with compassion, creativity, and courage. You don't do your most creative work when you're stressed. Mm -hmm. When you're absolutely stressed or depressed, you're not doing your most creative work. You're not yeah. doing your, your most compassionate, you know, what the Buddhists would call wise compassion as compared to dumb compassion. Mm -hmm. you know, there are forms of compassion where if you get into suffering and pain with the other person, you feel so much empathy that you are now suffering. Like my, my beloved is a midwife, right, and a nurse. Mm -hmm. If she's got somebody who's in, in, who's in t intense pain delivering a baby and the baby and mother's life's at risk, she can't be feeling her, those, those people's pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would put her at a you know, dysfunctional place where she couldn't be the most adaptive and responsive to help save their lives. So yeah. she, for true compassion, she needs to stay in calm balance. Um, and so th this is what we talk about where, you know, compassion... Uh, needs to express through creativity and courage. So what we found with these highest expressions of compassion, the three C's, compassion, creativity and courage in the heart, head and gut brains uh, are actually uh, synergistic. They, they rely on each other for their wisest forms. Mm -hmm. Wise courage needs compassion and creativity. Mm -hmm. Wise compassion needs creativity and courage. Mm -hmm. Wise creativity needs compassion and courage. Because if you just have creativity but you never take action in the world, Mm -hmm. You actually don't get off your ass, so to speak. Now, listen to the neurolinguistics of that. If mm -hmm. you don't get off your ass and take action, why do we say get off your ass and take action? Obviously, because you're sitting down. But, you know, we, we relate it because I think in, intuitively we know that the gut brain is involved in the prime function of motility, of getting moving. Mm -hmm. So when we're lethargic and not taking action through fear, we are usually not motile, not moving. We're not taking action. And it's because we're sitting in fear which might masquerade as lethargy, and then there are all of this, the health impacts of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and so, uh, you know, Dale would see that all the time. Uh, and, and one of the key things to do is start getting th that shift at the heart level. If you get the shift at the heart level, the heart is the emperor, then the rest will come into, it will fall into line. But you've got to get the shift at the heart level, but then you've got to support. The, the emperor can't just go, you know, take march there, and if the general, the, the guard, and yeah. all of the, the visceral organs don't, don't have the, the, you know, the energy, the ability to be able to support what the heart wants, what the person mm -hmm. wants. Now, let's link this back to, say, something like goal setting. Mm -hmm. yeah, goals and, and, and we said the prime functions of the, the heart are around values, what's important to you. So where do you hold your, your goals? Not the head-based goals that you just write down on a list and, you know, it was a great idea but you're never going to take action on it, right? But the ones that really, truly speak to your heart. You hold those goals as deep values in your mm -hmm. heart. That's true. Yeah. Very yeah. true. So th there's a goal setting uh, you know, uh, insight right from the start. Make sure that whatever goals you're writing down on your goal lists, you better make sure they actually speak to your heart. Because if they don't speak to your heart, if they don't really move you at a heart level, you're not going to take action on them. It's just a bunch of kind of creative ideas, right? Mm. It's just a story you're telling yourself, and which might be distraction pattern number 23 uh, to ensure that you never actually take action, right? So mm -hmm. you've got to start tracking them at a heart level. But if you don't take those values at the heart level and, and inform the gut that this is something that you truly want, just like the people who are pushing through fear. When I spoke to these incredibly brave you know, soldiers, uh, they said that uh, they felt the fear, but they actually had to tap into at a heart level something that was so important to them, like the saving of someone's life. Mm -hmm. right? It had to be a value that was so important that they'd be willing to go and, and literally die to save the other person's life, mm -hmm. to be able to push through the fear. So yeah. what they do is, they, with their head, they breathe down into their heart, and then from the heart, they breathe down into their gut, down the spine, taking, getting some spine, getting some backbone, taking that value. They, they, they said things like, if I hadn't gone in through that door, I wouldn't have been me. It was so important for me to do this that I wouldn't have truly been me. You, know, you hear that core identity, that gut. So they, they took that value and went, this value is so important, it's who I am, gut level. And mm -hmm. they breathed that down in their gut from the back and pushed through the fear that was in the front of their gut. 
And so if you take your goals and you literally do that, you as you breathe in, you breathe in the, the value of the goal, right? You feel it in your heart. You build it up in your heart. You do visualization. As, imagine it's a color, et cetera, a symbol, whatever. You breathe into your heart, up to your head, down to your heart, up to your head, down to your heart. So you're building and building that sense of heartfelt importance. And then when you're ready, you breathe it down in your gut. Now, by the way, there's a technique from uh, the Taoist philosophy, again, the Chinese traditional medicine, called uh, swallowing a smile. Uh, it comes from Mantak Chia. And um, Muntak gave us permission to put uh, a modified version of that into our own work. Um, he really loves M-Brain, thinks it's a you know, really powerful uh, model mm -hmm. and completely aligns with his own Taoist work. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you do is when you're ready, when you're really ready and you're breathing that value, fill your mouth with saliva. Imagine the saliva is imbued with that goal, with that thing that you so truly want at a heart level. And when you're ready and you're ready to take it to gut level, as you breathe down the gut, you swallow and you literally swallow that saliva that metaphorically you've imbued with the value, mm -hmm. the importance of this goal. You swallow it down to a gut level, you will feel it. Hmm. And there's a reason why you'll feel it at a gut level, and it's why people do things like um, they choke up with emotion, and why people, uh, if, they, if there's an idea they can't express, they'll literally say, oh, it's stuck in my throat. Mm -hmm. And it's because the whole of the throat and the esophagus from the mouth all the way through to the gut brain is co innervated by the somatic system and the enteric nervous system. So the nerves of both these two brains, the head brain and the gut brain, co-innovate throughout the whole from the tongue all the way down, mm -hmm. mouth all the way down to the gut. They co-innovate. So when you consciously decide to swallow, you actually are innovating all of the nerve signals that go down to the gut brain, sending a really strong overlapping signal between the head brain and the gut brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of the nerves in the if you think about that fetus, remember, so in the womb, the fetus is developing, the gut brain forms first. Mm -hmm. Then as the neural tube rolls up, the heart brain, a little output to make the heart brain. Then finally, the neural tube, tube rolls up and forms the head brain, encephalon, mesencephalon, etc. Mm -hmm. So the gut brain forms first. The gut brain is primal in evolutionary sense and in the womb, the developmental sense, which is why gut reactions are so primal. They so over, you know, that they, if you have a gut reaction, you can forget your head. Your head is not in the game anymore. When you've had total gut reaction to something, gut response, it just kicks in, baby. Mm -hmm. Your head yep. is, you know, so forget it, right? Yep. You'll be trying yep. to figure out what happened after the fact, but the reality is your gut reaction will have kicked in first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what it turns out in, in the way we evolved, because we evolved as worm-like creatures first and the gut brain was primal, when we developed these other neural networks and in the human, you know, the head brain is so freaking huge. It's got so, it's got you know, a hundred billion neurons, it's, it's, you know, they've now discovered around about 80 billion, not quite a hundred billion, but we'll, you know, round up, call a hundred billion neurons. It's a lot. It's taken over in our world and in our society and the stories, the creative stories, the head brain tells starts to run amok in our lives, right? But unless we can bring it back into balance, majority of the signals, as in the majority of the nerves between the head brain, the heart and the gut brain travel upwards, mm -hmm. right? They're what's known as afferent to the head brain. So, 80% uh, of them travel upwards, which is why if, if you've ever had a gut response to something, like you've got a, uh, say you, you have to go and do a talk um, and you're not used to doing talks or you have to go and do a presentation or you have to go and do something that's vitally important and you're really nervous about it, mm -hmm. do an exam, say, and you've got that you know, sort of butterflies in the tummy or you, is that, you know, nausea in the gut, have you ever tried to talk your gut out of feeling that way? You know, go and there's no logical sense. I, um, this is not helping me. Go and do that exam and feel nauseous or, you know, feeling butterflies before a talk. What the hell? I can, I've done this talk 10 times. I could do this talk, all right? But your gut brain, if you, if you try and talk to your gut brain with your head brain, forget it. The gut brain ain't listening because the majority of the signals go upwards, right? which is okay. why if you want to shift the gut brain, a gut reaction, you can't do it through head brain talking. Okay. What you've got to do it is through various ways in which the gut brain communicates. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a language center mm -hmm. like the head brain. It doesn't have a Vernicki and Broca's area. Mm -hmm. The heart brain doesn't have the, you know, a language center, mm -hmm. which is why in spiritual and esoteric traditions, they say that the heart and gut, and, and in most spiritual traditions, by the way, I came across an anthropological study that looked at Aboriginal spiritual traditions across mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. and they, they found that the majority of them said that we have three souls. Mm. or three centers of intelligence and they viewed them at head, heart and gut level. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get these you know, heart and gut level things aligned, you need to communicate in 
a, in a physical way, a physiological way, with like you know, Dale was saying, with gestures, with certain ways of using your mind-body system. So the breathing is a really key one. It's mm -hmm. a gateway into controlling the heart and the autonomic nervous system. Yes. The, um, and we talk about this much more in our book, and we've got you know um, three MP3s on our website, mbraining.com, if people want to go and check this out, because you know in this in this uh, talk we probably won't have time to get into any of the details on this. But we've got lots of free resources on our website. People can go and check it out. They've got you know um, breathing paces that'll help people to breathe in just the right way to get autonomic balance. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the thing is you know when you swallow, you're communicating the way the gut brain needs to to be communicated with. You're saying when you swallow. Everything's calm, everything's good, everything's copacetic. And by the way, here's the message I want for you. Digest this, this goal that's in our heart. So when you swallow, you're taking all, you're firing off neural signals and you're sending pathways of neural information down from that, from the head into the heart, down into the gut. When the head, heart and gut are aligned, especially when you're in autonomic balance and you're not stressed or depressed, that's when you're coming from your most adaptive response. And if you add in compassion, creativity and courage to that mix, if you really breathe compassion into your heart, take it up to your head where you add in a sense of creativity and then breathe that back down to your heart to feel those values of, of the importance of that creativity and compassion, that compassionate creativity. And you then breathe that down and swallow it down into your gut. To add in a sense of really core courage of you as a gutsy being. Mm -hmm. right? And then you take that compassionate, creative courage and breathe it back into our heart. There's nothing that can stop you. Your human spirit comes alive. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what our coaching methodology is all about. You know, uh, s simple, powerful t you know, techniques mm -hmm. to allow people to start getting their life aligned. And that, you know, a part of that will be you, there'll be times, depending on what's going on in your life, what stressors you've got, whether they're chemical, biological, could be you know, pathogens, um, all sorts of things, stuff in your personal history, you know, beliefs, etc. You need to go and see Dale. Mm -hmm. You know, someone with yeah. Dale's skills, someone who can help you really get back into balance quickly using all sorts of things from acupuncture to herbs, etc. Because different people need different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. One thing, yeah. I can tell, one thing I can tell you, and Dale, I'm sure, will have seen this. Uh, each of us has, in our terminology, what's called a neural preference, right? a brain preference. Mm -hmm. The way you're embraining your life, you know, multiple braining your life. Some people are more heart-focused and then head focus. Some people are more heart focused than gut focus. Some people are more gut focused than head. So when they go to make decisions or they're tracking, you know, through life, or that you might see somebody doing more as a head gut or head heart. Each of us has patterns and preferences because you know n brains are neural patterning systems. Patterning systems are do patterns. Another word for patterns is habits. Mm -hmm. And you know because of neural plasticity, the brain that thinks changes itself. Every time you do a, a behavior, it increases the probability you'll do that behavior again. That's how patterning systems work. Mm, so yes. people end up with patterns and preferences. Say, if someone comes to Dale who's a heart-gut person in their preference, right, in their mm -hmm. patterns, they're going to probably need to be treated differently and have different um, issues and challenges if at an you know, uh, immune function level, at an energetic level, than somebody's doing a head-gut way of processing. Mm -hmm. Dale, yeah. do you want to speak to something like that? You see it all the time. Like in acupuncture, we don't do a cookie-cutter approach to treating patients. Uh, people come in and they can tell me, oh, they have high stress, you know, they have trouble sleeping, you know, their digestion is interrupted, you know, they have issues eliminating, they're either constipated or they have the opposite effect where they're running to the bathroom because they're having, you know, very chaotic urges to defecate. Um, and the points that I treat or use to treat these people, it, it's based on what, what you're seeing. So if you're seeing heart symptoms, you know, like almost manic symptoms where they're very high stressed and they're, you know, they can't calm down, they're not sleeping. Well, okay, we're going to use points to calm that down, you know, as quickly as possible. We, th we call it like heart fire. When you see manic or people that are, they've worked themselves up into this stressful situation and, you know, their fight or flight mechanism is kicked in and their endorphin levels are, not endorphin, but their epinephrine levels. I'm sorry, I misspoke. But, you know, the adrenal glands have dumped all this adrenal, you know, adrenaline in their system and they're, you know, they're shaking. You see people shake, you know, they're, they're so upset. So you're like, okay, come here, boom, boom, boom. These deals are for you. And nine times out of 10, these people fall asleep. Mm -hmm. Because the re the reaction of the treatment, I'm not doing anything. You know, their body is having a reaction to the stimulating of the point, the certain point near a certain nerve, telling the brain, you know, telling usually the midbrain, there's something wrong, and then the you know it tells the frontal brain or the front lobe, hey, you need to examine the body and deal with this. And so it's funny how 
how we're taught traditionally is being proven scientifically with all this, you know, they're finding out that, yeah, there is this, you know, mechanism involved and that we're stimulating it by, you know, putting needles in or stimulating it by giving people a certain herbal formula to do the same thing. You know, I sell a lot of pills to calm people down. Why? We see a lot of stress in the United States. You see it in Australia. You see it in any developed country that has, you know, an upper, middle, and lower class. You've got people in different, you know, socioeconomical uh, situations where, you know, their stressors are different. You know, I see people that have a high income, you know, retirement because I'm down here in Florida. A lot of people have retired. So you see these retirees that have busted their, you know, they've worked hard to get what they wanted. And then you see younger people who are in school and then you see kind of the middle group, which is that middle class of, you know, people living paycheck to paycheck. So it's interesting looking at, you know, the body is three levels, but then we can look at a socioeconomical situation in the same way. So it's very interesting. The concept is very deep. And I, I need to get that book because, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's touching on a lot of stuff that I've been shown in tradition, you know, spiritual traditions as well as martial art traditions, as well as my, you know, uh, professional training as an acupuncturist and an herbalist. So it's interesting how something is crossing, you know, again, it's this concept crossing, you know, cultural boundaries. And that, that intrigues me. So I look forward to reading it. Yeah, that's definitely. Excellent. Thanks, Dal. I look forward to your feedback on it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, excellent. Well, the time is now 7 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Um, I really appreciate you having you here, Grant. Uh, Grant, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you, uh, Malik, for uh, your interest in our work. I really appreciate your support. It's fantastic. Well, yeah, um, I'm in-depth into in, uh, engrams. Ever heard of those? Yep. Any ramps? Uh, engrams. About, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, about the one through nine. So my whole thing is about being a tragic romantic, but uh, I'm a part. I'm a number four, a tragic romantic. So uh, I, by utilizing your uh, tools, um, how to use, uh, how to, about the multiple uh, brains and stuff, I've learned about more about compassion. I've learned more about creativity. I learned about my courage, and it helped me through evolve through my anagram setup, which is towards reformer or towards number one a lot better by researching your information and things about all these other things. Because people, by looking at the anagram, it's one thing to say that is uh, one section is heart, one section is gut, and one section is the brain or whatever. But from reading your book, I realize that this is just not metaphorical thinking. These are literal thinking organisms that can scientifically be proven. So that's yep. what I said. Oh, so it brings a lot of valid uh, validity to when people saying uh, spirit, mind, and body, or heart, brain, and gut is becoming one. Now it has more scientific validity behind that and why it works that way in these Eastern traditions Eastern traditions and stuff. But like, oh, they're not just crazy. It was a real reason yeah. why. You know? Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so yeah. I love that. Are you yeah. open to us doing another You're show in the fun. future, Grant? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the, as you know, the uh, this work touches on pretty much any aspect of, of what humans do. So it can be brought to play into almost any aspect of life. And uh, that's what we're doing ongoing research on. Super. Robert, did you say something? No, I did not. Okay. Um, Gr Dale, do you have anything to add? No, just that it's it was a wonderful show, and I appreciate you inviting me in. I, I love the subject, and I look forward to learning more through Grant's work and his research. Okay, and then I'll have you back on the show again after you've read the book or read more information on it and see what we can uh, get on further. Next show we do together, Grant, was actually to go through to find out the cool stuff that you can do with this information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll let everybody, I know everybody like, cool. what, what's all the cool information? I'm like, what's all the cool things that you can do? <laughs> well, we got one cool thing is about breathing you know how to do breathing and also swallowing the smile and the breathing techniques in order to enhance courage from back to front okay so those are two things I literally got two things physiological things that I got from that so that's going to be interesting yet okay everyone my name is Malik L train host of health awareness talk please everyone have a wonderful blessed day